when we open God's word, when we open the Bible and every page is God's word, uh, we often see texts, little bits of scripture that can be perceived in a couple of ways. And, and make note that I said perceived and not uh, interpreted. There is a difference between perception and interpretation. Uh, interpretation, uh, they both speak to how a text is received, but interpretation, we're taking those words, we're taking whatever text it is that we're reading, and we're trying to make some sense of it. Our perception is tied to that, but our perception is not wholly governed by that. In Philippians chapter 4, I'll give you an example. Uh, chapter 4, verse 8, it says this, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, we read that, and it seems to be very clear-cut. There is an imperative. Think about these things. And then the objects of that imperative are those things that are lovely, those things that are excellent, those things that are praiseworthy. praiseworthy. So there is not a lot of interpretive challenge there. It's very clear precisely what Paul is saying to do. Think about these things. Center your thoughts on these things. Build your, uh, your, your thought life around those kinds of things. But perception, the way you and I perceive things, makes us hear the second part of that a little bit differently. You see, you and I have one idea about the things that are lovely and the things that are excellent and the things that are praiseworthy, yes? We have this perception based upon who we are, the sons and daughters of God, bearing the Holy Spirit, having been trained up through our years in how to interpret those things. And so we see those things, the lovely, the excellent, the good, all these things, we see these things one way. But people who are not yet God's people might disagree with you and I. Their perception of what's excellent, their perception of what's lovely, their perception of those objects of the, of the command, their perception might differ from us. Where we say it's lovely, it is excellent that uh, we can gather and read God's word. It is lovely that Christ gave his life on the cross. Our neighbors, who are not yet God's people, may perceive that differently. They may look at the cross and see nothing but horror. They may see the time that we devote to hearing from God as anything but excellent. And the, we, we drill down and we, we begin to see that sometimes we say things, we tell things to our neighbors, we tell things to our, our unsaved loved ones, and we forget that we're saying one thing. We intend for our words to be received in a certain way based upon our collective experience, and we forget that our unsaved, unredeemed neighbors, our not yet God's people, loved ones, they're hearing those words in a completely different way. They're hearing those things almost contrary sometimes to the way that we intend them to be. I bring up perception because our perception, your perception, mine, ours as God's people, governs how we receive and process what God's word says. We don't come at this uh, I think Mike said it literally, right? Or literarily? Literally, yes, literally. Okay, we, we can't take God's word just literally and read the words off the paper. We need to know the story. We need to know how the story arc goes from beginning to end. We need to know who this God is that we're talking about. We, all of these things govern our perception of things. And so when we read the word, we're going to perceive these things in a certain way. But there's, there's a second level to this. 
And that is, some of us may have a bias towards the negative, where others of us have a bias towards the positive. Some of us have a sunnier outlook, some of us have a cloudier outlook. And that outlook, our, I see you two looking at each other, that outlook, that way that we perceive things, governs how we approach certain texts. I'm going to put it in a different word. Hopeful and hopeless. Not hopeless as in, as in not having hope, but hope hyphen less. Having a little bit less hope. I'll give it a different word. Some people are going to see hope in the text. Some people are going to see doom in the text. And it's all dependent on your perception, the way that you come at this text. And you're asking, well, Pastor, why does that matter? I can read the words. I can understand what it's saying. I can certainly interpret this. Well, it matters because our perception not only colors how we read the text, our, per our perception governs what we do with the text. Okay? If you have a bias towards the cloudy sky, if you are a, a rainy day type person and you read the text that we're going to open up today, you may be tempted to go out and start buying Nikes and, and you know, storing food away for, for that last time. On the other hand, if you have a sunnier disposition like myself and you know, you see, who laughed? You see nothing but the glass uh, full, right? Gla yeah, the glass completely full. When you read a text like this, you see hope rather than hopelessness. So now you're intrigued, right? You're saying, Pastor, what are you going to share with us? Well, you've got your Bibles. Let's open them up to chapter 13. And as you do so, buckle up, because this chapter all of 13 is the most challenging text in the Gospel of Mark. Just like it is when you get to Matthew chapter 24 and its other parallel in Luke 21. The language that we're going to encounter here is about the end times and Jesus is going to speak, write this down, apocalyptically. Okay? He's going to be using apocalyptic language. He's going to be using highly figurative language. And remember what, what that, that handsome cat on the video said a little bit ago, right? The Bible is written to a different people group. It is written to first century readers. When they read the text that we're about to encounter, they would understand every single word that Jesus is saying. They would understand every image that he's going to use. None of this is a mystery. On the other hand, here we are 21 centuries later, 20 centuries later, I can't do math, okay? Sometime later, here we are, and here's what our temptation is gonna be that you should never do. We can't take this figurative language and pull it into our day and time because it's not meant to be interpreted that way. So we're going to be looking for principles. We're going to be looking at what Jesus is really trying to communicate for you. And I'm going to give you a hint. I'm going to make it easier for you up front. This is a hopeful passage. So turn that frown upside down, right? Smiles, have that sunny disposition because what we're going to read, it sounds doomy. Sounds like a whole lot of doom in here, but it is not. This is a very, very hopeful passage. So I'm going to deposit this question for you, and then we'll have a little quiz later on. Are you ready for hope? Are you ready to be hopeful? Now, you're, going, you're, you're saying, yes, I am. I, I see your heads nodding up and down. But what governs that? your perception of things. The way you are going to perceive the text is going to govern how you receive it and what value it's going to be. So let's open it up, chapter 13 and verse 1. As Jesus was leaving the temple, remember he's been in the temple courts stirring up trouble. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look teacher, 
What massive stones, what magnificent buildings. And Jesus turns and he says, do you see all these great buildings? Replied Jesus, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. I was after a splash of cold water. And we don't know which of his disciples asked that question, but let's, uh, let's pin it on Peter because he's the most impetuous, right? Now, Peter is not bragging. He's not, he's not trying to draw some deep theological point. They're walking out of the temple. And, and if you've never really studied the temple, you know, take a little bit and, and look at the, this thing. This is a gargantuan thing. This is not the size of our building here. This is enormous. And it sits, uh, it towers over the rest of Jerusalem, and really all of Jerusalem is built around this. The holy city is there to support the temple and everything that goes on in it. And so when this unnamed disciple is pointing out how glorious the temple is, he's understating it. It is beyond glorious, whatever the next word up uh, for glorious is, uh, spectacular. How about that? That's what the temple is. And then Jesus points to it and says, not a single one of these stones is going to be left on another. Now, this is our first figurative language. This is the first apocalyptic bit. Jesus is not just waving at the temple. Jesus is waving his God arms all over and talking about every bit of Jerusalem, that every bit, every nook and cranny of Jerusalem was going to be finished. Now, that is an astounding statement. It's that statement that is going to get him accused of insurrection. And it's going to be a big part of the trial. But you see, Jesus is telling his disciples, don't count on this temple. No matter how magnificent you think it is, no matter how historical, what great things have gone on in this temple for the past hundreds of years, don't count on it. Don't put your faith in this temple. Because this temple, as well as all of Jerusalem, is going to get destroyed. They move out of the they move out of the temple and they go to a hill across from it on the Mount of Olives. And Mark picks up in verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew, so the inner circle plus Andy, asked him privately, "Tell us, when will these things happen?" And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Well, we'd all like to know that, wouldn't we? We would all like to know what the sign is that the end is going to come. We, we want to know what's going to tell us that everything that we've banked on is going to be fulfilled. Now, of course, that lies at the root of almost every heresy that has gone on for the past several centuries. That lie, that question. And trying to answer that question on our own has been at the heart of every cult that has been formed in the name of Jesus for the, the last 100, 200 years. That question, if you've read Matthew 24, you already know the answer to. Nobody knows. Jesus doesn't know. The Holy Spirit doesn't know. Only God the Father knows when that's going to come. So their perception now, they're a little bit concerned. You, you can tell that they want to know when this is going to happen. So Jesus is going to tell them using this hyperbolic, this highly figurative apocalyptic language. Listen to what he says in, in verse 5. First of all, he says, watch out. That's the key words in this passage. Watch out. Be on the ready. Look out. Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many are going to come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. Now you read that and you wonder why in our day and age 
there are still people representing national di natural disasters and war and this as signs of the end when Jesus just said these are not the signs of the end these are things that are going to continue until that but these are not to be read as signals he says, first of all, people are going to come and say, I'm Jesus. I am the resurrected Lord. I am he. I bear his message. He says, don't believe him. He says, don't believe him. So if someone sets themselves up in this day and age as Jesus, as the resurrected Lord, as the one who is to come, you know already, don't believe them. Don't follow them. Don't listen to what they say. But then it gets a little dicier because people have been doing this for years and years. They read the Bible and the newspaper side by side. Well, I guess not the newspaper. Who reads the newspaper? They read the internet and the Bible side by side, looking for signs, looking for signals that the end is about to come. But Jesus says, when you hear of wars and rumor of wars, don't be alarmed. Be hopeful. War is a natural institution between uh, fallen people. It's not a sign of the end. It's not something new. He says, such things must happen, and still the end is to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Okay, so we accept that. So if the newspaper says tomorrow the whole world is coming to an end because this war is going on, maybe, but probably not. Okay, that is a natural outcome of fallen people. He says there are going to be earthquakes and famines and all kinds of horrific natural, nat natural disasters. He says, but those are not signs. Those are beginnings of birth pains. Now, only 50% of us in this room recognize what birth pains feel like. The rest of us experienced it vicariously. But Jesus is using the most painful thing that people in the first century would understand. And the reason he's using this pain is because it is prolonged goes on and there's this wave of pain. So he's using this super descriptive language. He says, but none of those things point to the end. He picks up in verse 9. You must be on your guard, so watch out. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must be first preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will be pray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Okay, so he's already dismissed the natural disasters. He's dismissed the war. He's dismissed the ongoing conflict between people. He says those are not signs of the end. He says, I'm going to make it more personal for you. Your own family, your family that you love, when things get so dicey, they're going to betray you. They will turn you in for following after Christ. You will be made to stand before the law. And here's where the hope comes in. Here's where that sunny disposition is needed. The reason that Mark sticks this verse 10 in the middle of this dialogue is because he wants to remind you that what Jesus is saying is hopeful. He says, you're going to go before the law. You're going to get flogged. You're going to get thrown in jail. You're going to get in prison. You may have to stand before the governor. You may have to stand before the king. Now, what happens when you go to the king and you give the king bad news? Right? Your head comes off. So Jesus is telling you all these wonderful things. But 
That's where perception comes in. If you see, if you have that negative perception, you're going to go, oh, I don't want any of that to happen. And you're going to be tempted to start backpedaling on your faith. You're not going to tell anybody. You're not going to stand up in this day and age for what's right. But Jesus says, you get thrown in jail. You have to stand before the governor. You have to stand before the synagogue. You have to stand before your mayor and your governor and the president of the United States and even the king. If you have to do that, you are blessed because you're going to get an opportunity to be my witness. That's hopeful. This is a, if you stand up and you stand up in this day and age for what's right. If you stand up for what's right, no matter if you're going to get canceled, no matter if you're going to get fired, no matter if you're going to get erased from all of history, if you will stand firm to the end, because that's what Jesus said, everyone who stands firm to the end is going to be safe. But you've got to look at this as the opportunity that it is. You have this unique opportunity in this moment to stand up for what's right, to stand up for the biblical principles that you know that you have built your life on. Even, even if your brother betrays you, even if your father betrays you, even if everyone hates you, if you stand up for what's right, if you act as my witness all the way to the end you already know your eternity you already know the promise that you have you can see why perception is so crucial in reading a text like this that same perception is so crucial when you read Revelation and when you read Ezekiel and, and those, all these kinds of texts like this You've got to come at this with the hopeful perspective. Jesus is giving us great hope here. But then he turns. And now he's going to answer the question. So I'm in verse 14. He says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation. You read that in Daniel. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, who knows what the abomination that causes desolation is? Don't raise your hand. Nobody knows what that is. But Mark's readers knew exactly what that was. Somehow through all of time, we have lost the definition or the understanding of what that is. There's a warning there, isn't there? I'm sure we have all heard various interpretations of that, pointing to something in the 20th or 21st century. That's the abomination that causes desolation. Now, if we hear something like that, what do we want to do? We want to go back to verse 1 and reread this passage here where Jesus says, don't look at stuff like that. Nobody knows. So Jesus uses this language, Mark records it, and we read it. That's why he says, let the reader understand. But here's what matters. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now Jesus is starting to point out some things to watch out for. When the end comes, your natural reaction is to be to come into the city for protection, right? People from the surrounding area would naturally try to flock in behind the walls of the holy city. They would try to get in behind the walls and be protected from what's to come. And what Jesus is saying is don't put your trust in these, these examples of power. Don't put your trust in this temple. Don't put your trust in this city. Don't put your trust in anything but me. That's what Jesus is drawing us to. He said, let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. This is how awful things are going to be. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray. 
Pray that the end will not come in winter because those will be the days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. She's pointing to the end, the only end there will be. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or look, there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. He said that three times now. Watch out. Be on your guard. Be ready. I have told you everything ahead of time. Now you take that, you take that text, and, and it could give you a little shiver, couldn't it? You could read this and go, man, things are going to be simply awful. And I may have been in prison, and I'm not going to have any friends because everyone hates me. And it, it could be a, a total downer. Except everything that Jesus has said is hopeful. He said, even if you get thrown in jail, even if your father or your brother turns against you, that is a blessed opportunity to witness. He said, the things that you have your trust in, review those things now because none of them are going to stand. None of them are going to be worth anything when the end comes. Trust only in what Jesus says. He says, it's going to be awful. It's going to be awful. But you... You will stand. And there's part at the very end here. Most by, by the time Jesus gets to this, a lot of people have tuned out because they're worrying about the next earthquake or they're worrying about getting thrown in jail. But look what he says. And tell me this doesn't speak to the 20th century and the 21st century. False messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive. You got to be on your guard. You've got to have trust in the hope that is embedded in you. You don't want to be drawn this way or this way by someone who is, who is prophesying, who is saying, I've got this, this word from God. Jesus says false prophets, false messiahs, false everything is going to come. He says, be on your guard. And now Jesus, look at that last sentence there in uh, 23. I have told you everything ahead of time. And what does that mean? Jesus has told you everything ahead of time. That means that speculation, not necessary. We don't need to lay awake tonight wondering if we miss something. We don't need to be scanning the horizon tomorrow looking for some sign that we may have missed. Jesus told everything that you need to know. Is you don't know when it's going to come. All you need to do is be prepared. If you suffer consequences of following after Jesus, you're blessed. That is an opportunity that not everybody gets. He says, be hopeful. So when Jesus finishes this, and he says, be on your guard. He says, be ready. I've told you everything you need to know. Well, if we come at that with that hopeful, sunny disposition, that, that hopeful perspective, well, you and I get built up, we get strengthened, we, we grow stronger, we, we grow more hopeful, sunnier -er, if that's possible to be. None of this, none of this hope that we have when we read something like that, none of the, none of the, the good perspective that we gain when we read something like that is based on our feelings. All this stuff is awful. We, we would prefer that this stuff not happen to us. But we count on the promise of the one who spoke it. Our hope isn't built on our feelings. Our, our hope is not built on whether we're happy or sad. Our hope is built on the promises of Jesus Christ. And so while a hopeful perspective makes life better when things are going well, a hopeful perspective, having that positive perception of things, well, it makes even things like this, things that seem um, hopeless, makes those things not only tolerable, but makes those things 
uh, the opposite, makes those things something that we can uh, apply to our lives, something we could actually look forward to. When Jesus says, I've told you everything you need to know, I've told you everything that, that you know, that, that will set you up for this. And what he said is, be ready, be prepared, be on your guard, do all those things. And so if you stand up in this day and age and you speak out and say, no, I, I stand for this principle. I stand for life. I stand for justice. I stand for the truth of Jesus Christ. If you do that in this day and age, well, you know, it's, it's, it's a dicey proposition. Any more, that can cost you a lot of things. It could certainly cost you your job. It could cost you your friends. It could cost you your family as they separate from you so that the trouble doesn't get all over them. But think about what Jesus said. He says, you find yourself in that situation. You find yourself having lost this or struggling with this. Your family betraying you, former friends hating you, whatever it is. He said, don't look on that as, as a downer. Look on that as an opportunity. Look on that to stand firm. To say, no matter what you say to me, no matter what you do to me, no matter what you take away from me, I will not change my position on Jesus Christ as Lord. I will not change my position on the sanctity of life and on and on and on. Because once they've taken everything away from you, there's nothing else to be taken away, but you still have the most important thing that we just sang about 10 minutes ago. You are still a child of God. You are still the heir of Jesus Christ. You are still the son and daughter of God and every promise that Jesus has ever made to you still holds true. And that's why Jesus says, those that endure to the end, those that don't turn away, those that don't abandon their faith, they will be saved. So now you're saying, Pastor, where's this hope that you talked about? Well, that's it. That's the hope. No matter what this world does to us, no matter what this world takes away from us, it'll be uncomfortable. It'll be like those birth pains. No matter if we lose all of our family, we lose all of our friends, no matter what, the promises of Jesus do not change. There's one more. There's one more bit of hope. And as you stand on that, as you bank on that promise, as you refuse to be cowed by any kind of threat that comes to your life, you are standing as a witness to what you believe. No one will ever doubt you again that you stand firm in your belief. So brothers and sisters, my friends, whether you see things half full or half empty, be hopeful. Be hopeful, especially as we read God's word. We live in a day and age, I know, where there are loud, loud voices screaming at us, you know, screaming, this is hopeless, that's hopeless, this is, this is the end. But listen, don't listen to them, listen to your Lord, to the Lord of hope. Listen to him. He is the source the sustainer, the creator, and the guarantor of your salvation and the beginning and end of your hope. Whether we're called to patiently and quietly endure or whether we get blessed to be called as a witness to our faith, either one, our positive, hopeful perspective is going to make all the difference and how we handle things, how we receive that calling, how we deal with whatever life brings our way. So find hope, find hope, find hope where everybody else is seeing nothing but hopelessness. Be hopeful and help others to be the same. Amen? Amen.